All right, so this famous short story, uh, The Use of Force by William Carlos Williams, published in 1938, is famous for many things. Uh, class structure, um, submission, force. Um, it has dialogue, but there's no dialogue tags. And so it's very casual, conversational, and the conflict begins right away, and it just escalates, escalates, escalates. Um, and so let's talk about, you know, the use of force in society and in this story. As a teacher, especially when I taught, um, you know, kids that struggled with learning and refused to do their homework, refused to listen, uh, the class clown who wanted attention, things like that. And I totally understood why they were doing what they were doing. You know, if you're not getting attention at home, if you're not getting positive attention, if you're not, you know, making it in the world, whether it's in sports or academics or whatever, you're going to, you're going to get attention, right? Um, and sometimes I would get so upset, right, as a teacher, I felt like this doctor sometimes. Of course, I never laid hands on a, a student. Uh, I never threatened a student, but I wanted to, for the good of the person, for the good of the student, say, don't you realize what's going to happen if you continue to take drugs, if you continue running with a bad group, if you continue this lackadaisical attitude you have towards education? Hey, if high school's not working for you, try something else, right? But you would get so upset, you wanted to hurt the person for their own good. And I know that does not make any sense. It's a paradox, right? So that's the paradox this doctor faces. He's sympathetic for the daughter, but also feels like, I want to help you, but he realizes at the end, I actually hurt her more than I have helped her because there was really no help for her. She was going to die. Regardless of the doctor's expertise, she was going to die of diphtheria. And the girl knew it, right? Now, there's intuition, there's knowing something and having a suspicion, but then there's like the actual proof of it. And for the daughter, the actual proof is so crushing, right? Let's think of times when people in authority need to use force, right? Uh, police officers, hey, I told you to stop. I told you to, I had my sirens on, you didn't listen, you didn't take out your, and so there's the use of force. And sometimes that use of force is deadly force. So we get, you know, tased, you know, shot, and we can criticize saying, okay, why did this person get shot? It was, a, you know, there was a headlight out or a taillight out. Is that a proper use of force? If the person had a gun and it was pointing at somebody, so it was a gun versus a gun. Well, that's, you know, perhaps a different story. Um, the use of force with parents, like if you've ever seen a, you know, a child get beat, like, you know, the kid's being a brat or acting up in a store and the parent starts smacking the kid on the butt or, God forbid, on the face. Uh, is it, it, does that ever work? It might stop the bad behavior, but it doesn't correct the bad behavior. So this story makes us think about the use of force, um, whether it's an individual trying to help a patient or whether it's a, you know, as parents, will you use force, right? Uh, physical force. Of course, you know, the Americans and the Brits and the, and the French needed to use physical force against the Germans and the Italians and the Japanese because that was the really only way that <laughs> you're going to stop uh, the genocide and, you know, Hitler taking over and Japan taking over and, uh, and Mussolini on their coattails. But this story is not about military force, um, but it's about personal force. All right, let's take a look how 
the doctor describes the family. All right, there were new patients to me. All I had was a name, Olson, right? Please come down as soon as you can. My daughter is very sick, right? Does this new. When I arrived, I met the mother, a big, startled looking woman, very clean and apologetic, who merely said, Is this the doctor? and let me in. All right, so here we have, you know, a big, startled woman. We have the doctor and then immigrants, Olson. Uh, the story is 1938. Um, you really don't need to know that it's the Great Depression to understand the story, but it perhaps helps, right? $3 is a lot of money in the Great Depression, so the child needed to be really, really sick. And that's another reason the parents are so upset with the child, is that we're paying money for this good doctor to come, and we feel rather embarrassed, right? Because you're not cooperating, right? So there's all this force on this kid. And it's almost like if you've ever been or seen a like a meeting where you have the child and you have five teachers, you have the principal, you have, you know, the vice principal, you have the guidance counselor, and sometimes I just feel for the child because everyone there seemingly wants to help the kid, but there's so much pressure and the parents are threatening to take away football and there's like, you know, there's so much pressure on this kid is, you know, no one is actually forcing a tongue depressor down the throat, but there's still this, this, this use of force, right? So what we see here is kind of the, the doctor, a bit of condescension, right? Um, and, you know, saying as strong as a heifer in appearance, a heifer is a cow, right? Um, so again, there's this kind of noblesse oblige or like condescension on the doctor. He's not a bad person. He is there on a house call to help. All right. But again, you know, he feels, I see him as feeling a little bit superior. And what I love about this story is that it's, it's told as if he's just telling it, all right. It's very casual. Right when he says, um, she had a fever for three days, began the father, and we don't know what it comes from. So it's this kind of overheard dialogue. My wife has given her things, you know, like people do, but it don't do no good, right? It don't do no good, right? We can tell the education level based upon the dialogue, even though there's no quotations. And then there's a lot of sickness around. So we thought, you know, T H O. T thought you'd better look at her over and tell us what is the matter. As doctors often do, I took a trial shot at it as a point of departure. Had she a sore throat? All right, so what we see here is the doctor is telling the story after it has happened, all right, and is approximating and delivering as close as he can to what actually happened. But it's not in a formal style at all. Okay. Now, why doesn't the uh, William Carlos Williams, why doesn't he use uh, quotation marks? Like, uh, come on, it coax. Just open your mouth. Such a nice man, put in the mother. Look how kind he is to you. Well, because it's he's recreating it. You know, it's like he's remembering what had been said to him. And so you don't need the quotations, it makes sense totally the way it is. Come on, do what he tells you. He won't hurt you. Now, there is some irony, right? He won't hurt you. Uh, he will be hurting her. And that, I ground my teeth in disgust, right? So there we have his condescension. If only they wouldn't use the word hurt, I might be able to get somewhere. They know when you use the word hurt. Oh, he's not going to hurt you. This isn't going to hurt. Yes, it's going to hurt. Or like they say, this is going to hurt me more than you. Well, that's always a lie right? Now what the author does, uh, Williams does, he, he creates a lot of pathos for the child. Um, you know, he moves closer and with what cat-like movement, both her hands clawed, so we have a extended, uh, you know, uh, metaphor here, cat-like, crawled instinctively from my eyes. She almost reached for them too. In fact, she knocked my glasses off, the one broken several feet away, all right? And then, of course, the parents are embarrassed 
They're apologetic. You bad girl, said the mother, taking her, uh, taking her and shaking her. Now, they're doing this. Would you shake and say your child's bad if you know she has very short time to live? I don't think so. And what I see happening here is that the girl is doing everything she can to protect the knowledge that she knows. She knows and she wants to protect herself because it's like, it's, it's for me to know. I know what's wrong. I know I'm going to die. I don't need to be put through this. And of course, she's a child. She doesn't have much say. Then again, she does have power in the way she can treat these three adults physically, right? I cannot force a student to do well in class no matter how physical or how many zeros I give, they're still always the one in control. Now we see the, the doctor change his perspective. He says, I'd already fallen in love with a savage brat. All right, a little bit of an oxymoron, right? And not really a savage brat. It's not really oxymoron. But the idea of falling in love is a bit of paradox. And the parents were contemptible. In the ensuing struggle, they grew more and more abject, crushed, exhausted, while she, now again, he's using words as an educated man, like abject, crushed, exhausted, which shows his education level, while she uh, surely rose to magnificent heights of insane fury, of effort bred of her terror of me. Now think about why do we fear the dentist? Why do we fear going to the doctor? Because... They, they're going to hurt us. The doctor, the dentist, and the doctor could say, you have cancer and you have two months to live. Now, the father here is trying his best and he's a big man. So here we have the irony, too, that he, the doctor's about ready to have success, but he released her at critical times because he was ashamed at her behavior and he, was, he dreaded hurting her, right? But his dread also that she might have diphtheria made him go, tell me to go on go on. He himself was almost fainting while the mother moved back and forth behind us, raising and lowering her hands in agony of apprehension. Put her, put her in front of you on your lap, I ordered, and hold both of her wrists. So now he's the one in total control. I am telling you as the use, as the, as the force to do what you want me to do. But as soon as I did, the child let out a scream. Don't, you're hurting me. Okay, but now towards the end of the story, uh, the violence gets, you know, it's it's this rise of tension in a short story. You don't have the exposition. You don't know these characters well. You need to get to the conflict very, very quickly. And so what he does is grasp the kid's head, shoving this wooden tongue depressor. Some critics have seen this as sort of a sexual assault, right? Um, and... And he's furious at this child, right? And he uses that 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 dash. I was grown furious. Long pause at the child, and he's trying to hold himself down, but he couldn't. So we have words like grip the wooden blade, and the mother is like, "Aren't you ashamed? Aren't you ashamed to act like this?" You know, uh, but she knows she's trying to protect the truth, and she's trying to protect her dignity. And then, you know, the mouth is cut, she's screaming, hysterical shrieks, um, perhaps I should have desisted and come back in an hour, but no doubt it wouldn't have been better because I would have seen at least two children lying dead in bed of neglect in such cases. So this has been going on and the doctor is used to this. So from the doctor's point of view, it's almost like I can't see another child die of diphtheria. I can't, I, I'm facing death every single day and I'm frustrated. And I would have torn the child apart in my fury and enjoyed it, right? It's always a shock for students to say like, why would he enjoy tearing this child apart? There's this, there's this paradox, right? He's there to save her, but at the same time, she's doing everything in her power to thwart his ability. And if we think of people who abuse power, whether it's cops or teachers or, you know, pedophile priest, it's like, I told you to do something and you're going to do it. No. Okay. Then I'm going to use force. Right. And is that ever a good thing to do? Now the doctor's calling her a damn little brat. She must be protected against her own idiocy. 
one says to oneself at such times, right? That we that we use this type of logic, right? I needed to shoot the person. I needed to to beat the person up to protect them from their own idiocy. Well, okay, that's what we may say to ourselves, but really, is that the right thing? Others must be protected against her. It's a social necessity. All these things are true, right? He's he's convincing himself of this, but he hasn't convinced himself of that at all. And he says, but in a blind fury, a feeling of adult shame, bred of a longing of muscular release are the operatives. One goes on to the end. Like once he starts something, he needs to go all the way to the end, even though he knows it's wrong. And then in the conclusion, in the final unreasoning assault, all right, there's that kind of oxymoron. It's this is he's trying to use reason, but it's this is unreasoning assault. I overpowered the child's neck and jaws. I forced the heavy silver spoon back of her mouth and down her throat until she gagged. This this is what he's doing to this dying kid. And there it was, both tonsils covered with membrane. She had fought valiantly to keep me from knowing her secret, right? And like these parents, we know we need to know your secret. No, I'm trying to I'm trying to protect myself. She had been hiding the sore throat through, for three days and lying just to escape the outcome. Now she was truly, truly furious. Why? Because what she always knew and suspected all along was now confirmed by this doctor. She had been on the defensive before, but now she was attacked. So it's like insult to injury. You're dying, and yet you're still being abused. She tried to get off her father's lap and fly at me while tears of defeat blinded her eyes, All right? Uh, the father is like trying to protect her, right? Oh, you're my daughter, you're my daughter, but she wants to fly off the lap and flying at me, you know, at the person who has the force while she's defeated and blinding her eyes. So the pathos, the emotion there, right? So we have social class playing a vital role in this. All right, um, and there's this question, number four, would the author have achieved the same effect if he had chosen um, if, he, if he had chosen a student-teacher relationship rather than the doctor-patient? Um, I, you know, doctors can, you know, touch patients, right? That's what they do. They, they listen to your heart. They do this. They do that. Um, teachers, teachers don't touch students. So, it would be different. You could probably have this, a similar theme, but the violence of it. There's no way me, a teacher, is going to shove a heavy metal spoon down someone's throat, right, for their own good, right? That's just not going to happen, right? Um, so it's the relationship here. I am the authority. I'm the educated one coming to a poor house that does not have much money, and I'm going to be their savior, but he is not their savior, and he actually uh, hurts the girl in spite of himself. So, you know, did the doctor have to resort to the use of force? No. Was the outcome going to be the same? Yeah, right? And so, you know, at a traffic stop, does does a cop have to, like, shoot somebody just write down the license plate and get the person later if they're causing a problem okay um write down take down you have their name you have their license plate you can always go to the house and you know de-escalate but when the when the situation has escalated to such a fever like we have in the story reason and logic fly out the window right uh domestic abuse there's so much times when the use of force is not needed and we just need to de-escalate and think about am I actually going to get what I want here and is this going to end up poorly for all involved everyone involved in the story is hurt the girl will die the doctor has lost faith in his his humanity right and the parents are of course in like in shock uh, that they've been forcing their young daughter to submit to this abuse, right? Uh, and it all makes sense. They want to protect her, but sometimes the very things we do to protect our children, um, very, very vulnerable people in our society, is not actually the best thing for them at all. 
Um, and sometimes we just need to step back and see what other ways besides force can be used. Thank you.